All righty. Okay, well, welcome everybody to our Fall Commons Connect event. I'm Mary Beth. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies that we refer to as the Commons. Um, we have an awesome mix of people here today who are either students of ours in our programs, alumni of our programs, faculty in our department, staff of our team, or community partners that we have worked with before or that we hope to work with in the future. Did I miss any category? I think everybody here fits into one of those, right? Um, great. Well, we are going to not really share a lot about our center today. Um, specifically, you can learn a lot more about us if you don't know as much as you would like from the materials on the table and just look at our website. We do a lot of different things, but today what we really wanna highlight here is first of all, a little bit of a snapshot of some of our awesome CNPL students. We've been getting a lot of feedback that people wanna know more about our undergraduate students and program. Um, so I'm gonna kind of turn the spotlight over to them in just a moment. And then after that, we're gonna have what I'm thinking of as kind of a sample clatter of uh, flash talks by some of our affiliates, which include both faculty and community partners. And I think this is gonna be really interesting because although it will really just be a snapshot, it does give a sense from what I can tell already of the breadth of the types of work that we're seeing happening out there and also that we are lucky enough to be a part of. So thanks for joining us. Um, the bar continues to be open. We want you to be able to network and chat. So if you need to have a sidebar, just maybe go a little bit back towards the end of the back of the room while folks are presenting. So, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our CNPL students. I think I'm just gonna ask you guys to project out, share who you are, why you're in the CL CNPL program and maybe what you're focusing on or what you hope to focus on um, launching off from this undergraduate program. Hi everybody, my name's Becky. I've been working with the Commons for about two years now as an outreach engagement intern, which has been a great experience. I'm in this CNPL main group because I'm interested in working with human rights organizations in the future. Um, I'm gonna graduate after this semester and then that's what I'm hoping to back Okay. Uh, my name is Danny Hudson. I used to know that around. I was a fan of the CNPL program as a talent and a teacher. I'm also studying a legal term to make my legal objective and shadow of the Uh Personally, I'm looking to work with the overlapping between my practice at work and so, uh, sort of an advocate, uh, program like that, because that is the show that this advocacy, advocacy, et cetera, is what I'm I'm also but I don't want my adult yet, so I'm getting a master's degree to be
Thank you all so much. Um, these are these are all folks who are going to be looking for jobs in a couple of years. So keep them in mind. Meet them tonight. Um, great. Thanks, Thanks. Y'all. Okay. So now we're going to start the very challenging endeavor of trying to limit a series of flash talk speakers to three minutes apiece. And I actually don't know how we're going to exactly do that, but I know that they're super talented and prepared. So they're going to they're probably going to just wrap up right at like two minutes and fifty seconds, and it's going to be cool. Um, the list, I'm going to say the list in the order that I know, although we do know there's one flash talk that is going to be a surprise on where it shows up on the list and Tia is ready to jump up when the time comes, right Tia? Okay. All right. So just if you can all remember this order um, as much as you can, we can always help, but Allison and Jess, Maggie and Mike. That's a good point. Yes. Allison and Jess will go first and then Maggie and Mike. And then Matt Calvert, and then Kelly, and then Shahana, and then Steve, and then Amy, Kathy, John, Melissa, Mari, and Damon. And then Tia's gonna be our surprise. We're not exactly sure where she is, but she's a flexible kind of kind of person like that. So with no further ado, I'm going to invite Allison and Jess to kick us off up here. I might need Michaela to help me advance the slide. <laughs> okay, sorry. So they do just make sure they know what we're doing today. There you go. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Picalkins. I'm a community food systems educator at UW Madison Extension Dane County. And, and my name is Allison Pap Harris. I am the Farm to School Director with Reap Food Group, which is a nonprofit here in town working to connect uh, local agriculture with schools, the community, restaurants, just everybody. Um, so we're here today uh, to talk about a project. Uh, Title is up here, Advancing Racial and Social Equity in Wisconsin Farm to School, Strategies for Investing in Historically Underserved Producers. Uh, this work is one part of a project funded by a Wisconsin IDEA Collaboration Grant, and the other component of the grant project focused on school food, labor, and wages. Our partnership team includes Dr. Jennifer Gaddis, Dr. Amy Washbush, Allison Crook, Sarah Gia Trombone, and as well as an advisory committee. Um, so we had two primary study objectives of this project to examine the current landscape of historically underserved growers and value-added food producers in Wisconsin and their current access to farm to school markets, and then identify the opportunities and needs of these growers to participate in farm to school markets. Um, we launched a statewide survey in February, 2023. We also held six focus groups, uh, overall gathered 38 survey responses and had 21 focus group participants. And then for this work, we connected with producers who identify as historically underserved. The USDA describes historically underserved farmers as producers that have been historically underserved by or subject to discrimination in federal policies and programs. And producers that fall under this category include beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers, veterans, and limited resource farmers. Thank you, Jess. Through this research, four barriers presented themselves. In regards to knowledge, producers are unsure what products schools need. As for price, producers are not sure what schools are able to afford, with many noting li their likely inability to compete with large food distributors. Seasonality is a barrier, which in turn raises questions of processing and infrastructure capacity within the state. And it is unclear to producers what food safety certifications schools require. Recommendations were developed for three stakeholder groups, which included policymakers, schools, and support organizations. And I'd like to share a few. 
Policymakers are encouraged to bolster funding to support schools in purchasing local foods and create a statewide program similar to the current Wisconsin Local Foods Purchase Assistance Program, but specific for farm to school. This would create a dedicated team to guide producers through the local food supply chain, answering food safety questions, and providing aggregation and distribution to schools. Schools are also encouraged to adopt values-based procurement, which is a framework that considers values along with price when making purchases. If you'd like to read the full report, it can be found on the UW Extension Food Systems website. And along with sharing this presentation here tonight, we're gonna to be presenting to the National Farm to School Network um, in early January, 2024, and plan to submit to the Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems and Community Development. And with that, thank you so much and have a good evening. Hi, my name is Maggie Felker, and this is my husband, Michael Bird. And together, I'm silent part. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right here. And we're the, the directors and founders of David's Educational Opportunity Fund. We support, in the, since we've incorporated in 2012, we've supported uh, around 35 students, uh, low income students, in, mainly in Quito, Ecuador as they pursue higher education. We are truly a wraparound service. We provide everything from payment for dental care to um, another apartment if someone needs to live separate from their family because of abuse issues. We try to remove barriers to kids graduating and getting their education. So we've graduated students in psychology, engineering, fashion design, cosmetology, a variety of fields. And now we're developing partners in Ecuador who support our missions and give our, our young people pasantillas or internships. Um, the Wisconsin Idea Impact was an interesting one for us. We, as I understand the Wisconsin Idea, it's to not have education just stay in the classroom, but go out into the community and support civic values. And more and more, we're trying to develop a sense of community, even among our graduates, so they don't just go off. We provide benefits for them and community gatherings so that they think of themselves as a group who can someday impact society. And we are gathering um, business partners in Ecuador who support that. Um, the takeaways are that ordinary people like us at any age can start a nonprofit if you have an idea. It's not that hard and it's not that expensive. Um, and the comprehensive and personalized support that we give our students, including mental health support, psychological support, is essential. It's a wraparound service that is essential um, when supporting first generation students in Ecuador, just like it is here. And um, the other is that cross-cultural cross work um, does indeed require patience and humility and a sense of humor because there's a lot of things that are very different when you're working in another culture. Um, and the work of this fund is inspired by and dedicated to the life of our son, David Bird Falker, who was a world traveler and a remarkable person and student who disappeared in Ecuador in July of 2002, which is how we got drawn. So. All right, I'm uh, Matt Calvert. I'm a professor, a new professor in civil society and community studies and an extension specialist. And um, I, I feel threads which, from the two things that I'm gonna talk a little bit about extension and um, also about uh, building civil society with young people. Um, thinking about the ways that extension across the state of Wisconsin um, is actively uh, creating opportunities for young people to connect to communities and for communities to be more inclusive of youth voice. Um, so I just wanted, um, there's a framework that we've been working with and this is a little bit complicated, but it really ties together the experiences that young people have at the bottom of a spiral where they are 
um, engaged in projects uh, in their communities that are connected to the common good, um, give young people opportunities to develop partnerships across their communities and bridge their relationships to others in the community, um, which then leads to communities actually thinking differently about the way young people can be a part of civil society and young people um, thinking differently about their own roles. And so I just thought I would share some examples from across um, Extension's work, and I'll make sure to mention a couple of Dane County ones since Jess is here. Um, but uh, we have found that young people have a lot to offer in um, community planning and design um, that we've create when we've created space for young people to be represented on government boards or nonprofit boards, um, that they are able to uh, provide um, important perspective and um, most importantly, build relationships that, that entrench them more deeply and, and give, build a sense of belonging in the community. In Dane County, um, we have uh, um, formal opportunities for young people to be involved in the county board. There's a program called By Youth For Youth where young people are um, grant makers, uh, funding projects across the community, um, serving in health coalitions, advocating for teen centers in Fitchburg, um, and, pl and playing a, a significant civil uh, civic engagement roles in communities. Um, this, uh, these photos are actually from Iron County, far up north, um, from superior days where young people are part of a delegation of youth and, and, and adult civic leaders who come to Madison each year to represent uh, community interests to legislators. So young people being very integrated into representing and advocating what's going on in the community. In Milwaukee, um, we have a project called Growing Connections where young people have helped to uh, reinvigorate a really abandoned community garden that had become a dumping ground, um, creating arts and community and growing spaces um, in, in, that, in that work. But at the same time, uh, spending time understanding the history of the space and the neighborhood and why that community is, is as disinvested as it is and really developing an analysis of that work. Um, also learning a little bit about themselves and having some fun as, as young people. And so I wanna make a couple of points about uh, takeaways, really just, just two. Um, first is that a best practice is that we've learned is that young people need to work on issues of concern to the broader community and be really invested in the public good. Um, that connects them to the larger uh, fabric of the community and the work that's going on um, across the, across the um, the community and builds those relationships. And that the result then um, is this bottom one that young people often find that the most significant change in their work is in the change of the way the community thinks about young people and the culture um, of acceptance of young people as leaders in communities. Um, so that's the, the goal and the focus of the work when we when we approach it with intention. And I've got a resource, I think we'll be, I don't know for sure in these slides, but there's a, a, a publication about some best practices in engaging young people in community development. Yeah. <laughs> there's my text. Okay. Hi. Um, it's so awesome to be with all of you today and see familiar faces from my Madison community life. Um, so I'm Kelly Douglas, and I'm the Chief, De Chief Development Officer for Health Poverty Action USA. Uh, essentially, we work in solidarity with health healthcare workers, activists, and communities from around the world um, focused on improving health and addressing the root causes of poverty and injustice. We've recently registered as a nonprofit here based right in Madison, but doing our work globally. And we partner strategically with the, the HPA, the Health Poverty Action Brand, which has been in existence for nearly 40 years, um, doing work um, basically in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and what we're trying to do here in the US is expand and amplify the work that's being done. And just to give a couple examples of the type of things that we've been doing, last year we got some funding to help research the intersection between uh, HIV status and mental health. And um, I was fortunate enough to actually visit that project in Cambodia and Phnom Penh. And this year we're really focusing on integrating culturally appropriate maternal and child health care uh, for indigenous people into clinics and hospitals in Highlands, Guatemala. 
So these are just a couple examples to give you an idea of the type of work health property action uh, USA is doing. So what I really understood the Wisconsin idea to be is, is having impact, not only in, in Madison and Wisconsin, but globally as well. And how we approach this is we look at health as an issue of, of social justice. So we're not just looking at one element, but we recognize that this is fundamentally a political, social, and economic issue. Um, and we need to understand those root causes um, to be able to address health in general. One of the things that I really appreciate about Health Poverty Action USA is that we look at and focus and make our priority people who are missed out by other organizations. A lot of international development organizations tend to cluster in specific areas, and we make it our focus to look at people who are in some of the most remote areas that are often forgotten by their own governments um, or in conflict affected areas, um, pastoralists or indigenous people who are largely kind of forgotten for the, by the people working in their, their own environments. And then, of course, instead of looking at one specific aspect of health, we're trying to look at the a range of social determinants of health, because if we only focus on one, we might be missing others. So largely, we're looking at strengthening systems. So we do a lot of training of local people um, who, and so, and one of the things that I really appreciated about the work is working with local people who understand the local language, who understand the local uh, culture, and can help kind of inform and understand what issues are truly important in that area. Um, so nutrition, water, sanitation are also a, a few of the factors that we work on. And I'm here today just to tell you a little bit about Health Poverty Action, introduce you, um, but also ask for potential collaborations. So we're looking at potentially researching on collaborations, uh, excuse me, research collaborations. So even around pro programmatic work, we also do a lot of work around policy and campaigns. Uh, so, um, and just a few of the, the different things. So programmatic work might be one of the things that we really want to look at is female genital cutting in Ethiopia. Um, and another thing that we are looking at is drug policy reform uh, as it pertains to, as it interacts with climate justice. And we've actually just put forth a publication. So if anybody's interested in drug policy reform and uh, climate change, this couldn't be more interesting to you. So please pick up a copy of that. Um, we also have opportunities for student placements and just looking at project resources and technical support. So any kind of, if anything's, you know, kind of sparked your interest in the work that we're doing and you see any potential collaborations, I'd love to speak with you. And that's my information. Um, and I have cards up here and also a publication. So happy to speak with you later. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Shahana McKinney Balden. I didn't know it was my turn. <clears throat> I'm so excited to be here. This project for me is a grand convergence of my life off campus and my life on campus. So, Since ancient times, the Jewish people have been a diverse, multiracial, multi-ethnic community, and that diversity continues today. The Jewish Americans in 2020 Pew study found that 15% of US Jews under the age of 30 identify as Hispanic, Black, Asian, other race, or multiracial and that we, BIPOC Jews, face unique challenges in our communities. Racism pushes Jews of color away and we seek our refuge outside of our communities, shares Alana Kaufman of the Jews of Color Initiative, which commissioned a 2019 analysis that estimated the number of Jews of color in the US at 1 million. Jews of Color Initiative is one of the funders of Shalom Curriculum Project. We are at Wisconsin Center for Education Research, the Education Research uh, Center for the School of Education. And we are prototyping Jewish early childhood education and play materials. 
that celebrate racial and ethnic diversity in our Jewish communities. We have a wonderful researcher and coordinator at the helm. Her name is Awaku Michal Avera Samuel. I am co-principal investigator on this project. And we have amazing faculty partners in the School of Education and uh, in the School of Music who are supporting us. We are gearing up for all kinds of publications and presentations and we're really proud, and I'm personally really proud to be doing work to bring current research and practices around diversity and early childhood educational materials to our Jewish community. We're very behind in our community in this area, at least in this country. Another thing we're doing is bringing the work of Jews of color to prominence in the early childhood education field, working to include Jews and anti-Semitism in our more general analysis of social justice and diversity in our classrooms and our communities. We're doing some cool emerging coalition building work with other people who have hyper-minoritized experiences uh, minority within minority experiences like Asian Muslims. And I'm working very hard to bring others together to think about complexity and nuance in these times of such great polarization. This is our team. That's a picture of Michal working with a preschool student here in Madison. And that's our website. Looking forward to partnering. So excited for all the possibilities here today. Thank you. Thank you for that applause. <laughs> um, I'm Steve Goldberg. I am a proud member of the Commons Advisory Board, and I'm executive director of the WEA Member Benefits Foundation, which is based here in Madison. A couple years ago, we launched, ah, thank you. We, we launched a pilot project designed to test a funding model for the purpose of helping school districts throughout the state attract additional funding from the private sector for their student mental health programming. And we all know how important that has become in the last couple of years. And uh, what we've been doing is providing challenge grants to selected school districts, and then helping them with funder outreach, mostly in their own communities, to raise additional funding from the private sector uh, to strengthen their student mental health budget. Uh, in that process, we engaged as our academic partner, the co-create team from the UW Center for Community Nonprofit Studies. Um, and the purpose of engaging the team was to get their help in evaluating and refining this funding model so that we could scale it up beyond the five pilot school districts. We help those, those five pilot school districts attract an additional $1 million that they wouldn't have been able to attract before to support their student mental health programming, which enabled them to serve 5,000 additional students. Um, when the co-create team uh, led by Amy Washbush uh, started working with us, they sat in on our monthly user group calls so that they could understand what the school districts were going through, what the best practices and speed bumps were in the project. And they became part of our team, not just uh, a supplier of research help and evaluation support. Um, and I'll say this, that the questions that the co-create team asked me made me smarter as the project lead. Uh, in addition, um, the report that you see up here that I'm holding enabled us to add some credibility to the pilot project. And the, the report has been circulated to current and potential funders of the project and to school districts, uh, including the superintendents of the five districts that we've been helping. And the mental health coordinators in those school districts say it has added credibility to them, their work 
internally with the uh, hierarchy in the school district. So we really appreciate how co-create partnered with us and uh, made it possible for us to evaluate and refine the model, which we're expanding now. We're adding more school districts. Uh, this is part of the reason why we are able, are able to expand the project. And so I'd like to introduce the next speaker who is Amy Washbush, whose co-create team was responsible for helping us evaluate and refine the model. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Sorry, we have Tia. Tia. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening. You've probably heard my name 20 times by now, but my name's Tia Murray. I am currently the executive director of the Harambe Birth and Family Center, which is a newer nonprofit, but it's built on work that has been done in this community since the late 80s, which I was actually a product of. So it's very near and dear to my heart and very full circle. Our mission really is to provide a safe, respectful, alternative option in the community for folks to receive reproductive health care and family care and support and to provide it in a way that's community-based, culturally situated, um, and really allows folks to become part of their own health care. We really envision a world where birthing families are not only surviving uh, pregnancy, birth, and parenting, but they're thriving, and particularly for Black families in the state. So the Harami Birth and Family Center consists of three different programs. We also have a middle school, which is a whole nother thing. But our community care clinic is a free and charitable clinic that offers prenatal and postpartum health care to folks that are either on Medicaid or can't afford it. We also have families who can pay cash pay and that helps support those who do not. Um, we don't do any births yet, but our future goal is to open a freestanding birth center where the midwives that we're now training can then provide care for the community that we're from. We also have the Harambe Village Doula Program, which I founded about 10 years ago. And now I'm happy to be able to house that in a nonprofit in order to sustain the work and the impact that we've had in that program for the last 10 years, particularly around preterm birth, low birth weight babies, and breastfeeding um, success. Um, and then we also have a family resource center. So when we support the child, we have to support the whole child. And in doing that, we need to support the family and the caregivers as well. And as you know, there's a lot of social determinants of health, right, that really affect our health um, and that of our community. And so we didn't want to just do one thing without the others. So I think it really takes a village coming together to wrap our arms around families. Um, We've really taken a long game approach, as my mentor, Ms. Betty Banks, would say. Um, back in the day, the Harambe Center had a huge impact on Black infant mortality in this county that made huge news. And so really our ultimate goal is to reduce uh, Black infant and maternal mortality and morbidities. Um, so we've been taking steps coming together as nonprofit organizations to pool resources. We opened a Family Resource Center in 2017 and then purchased a building in 2021 to bring together what is now the Harambe Birth and Family Center. Um, we recently had some of our publications published in the Race to Equity Report, which is full circle for me because it was the Race to Equity Report in 2014 that really inspired me to do something okay. about the fact that our babies are dying at three times the rate of our white counterparts in my, in my own community. I'm a mother of five, and that's very important to me. Um, and then how it relates to the Wisconsin um, idea is that I think what we've created is scalable. Um, when I was a student here at SOHI, I oftentimes got reprimanded for spending too much time in the community and not enough time on campus. But I really do think we need to, be, we need to bring um, what's inside of these walls out to the community. Um, because as I mentioned here, we really have to work across all sectors public, private, governmental, academia. We need everybody and most importantly, we need the community who's affected the most. Um, it truly does take a village. We, we definitely learned that. Um, community involvement is critical. We really involve parents and families in the work that we do. 
Um, but most importantly, you want to have fun. Um, but you also want to make sure that your organization reflects your values in respect to health equity. So we really lift up other BIPOC leaders in the community to help us run our organization as well. And this is our team. Thank you. Uh, Steve and I try to keep that up, but Harambe mm -hmm. takes precedence, so I was happy to see that sign. Um, I'm Amy Washbush, and I'm the Associate Director at the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies, and I lead our Co-Create initiative, which has um, been mentioned a couple times, and now it is an opportunity to share a little bit more about that, uh, especially for those folks who may not be familiar. Uh, so what we do in Co-Create is we partner with nonprofits, government agencies, funders, academic colleagues, and others who really are working to make communities better. We leverage the processes and tools of research and evaluation to provide the answers to the questions that folks need to really advance those missions. Sometimes this looks like needs assessment projects, program evaluation, landscape scans, best practice reviews, gaining feedback from partners or from community members, a lot of different efforts. Um, since we started in 2017, we're closing in on 50 projects. We'll probably meet that mark this winter. Um, and we've had about 20 um, current or alumni student team members. There's an educational aspect to this that is really uh, valuable where undergraduate and graduate students in the School of Human Ecology get to apply what they learn to projects and get paid for it. <laughs> Very key. And we have several team members in the room. So those who have worked with Co-Create as members of the team, if you could give a little wave, don't be shy. Awesome. <laughs> and we have several of our partners in the room as well. So organizations and groups that have partnered with us, if you want to give a little wave, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, some current projects we're starting are REAP folks. They were here where uh, we have another project with them coming up, the Greater Green Bay Community Foundation 4-H Youth Development uh, with Matt as well. And uh, we've also been um, working on a course version of Co-Create so students can gain credit and learn about some of our strategies. And um, that'll also support a goal that we have of providing pro bono projects for local organizations. Um, Co-Create is really about learning together. So I just wanted to lift up some of our interesting learnings this year. It's a wonderful benefit of our work because we always get to learn more. Um, some of the things we've learned this year is how community organizations care for families with young children and care for the caregivers internally. Through case studies with the Department of Children and Families, we've been able to engage with groups all around the state who are doing really important things to help families um, not just transition to formal schooling, but how do you find a doctor when you move to new places? And caring for the caregivers, for example, um, providing free therapy for um, some on-site staff. We've seen great examples of that. We've also had an opportunity through a partnership with Dr. Larissa Duncan, who's with um, the uh, Human Development and Family Studies Program and Extension, about how to talk about and lift up the mental and emotional benefits of time and nature among Hmong and Spanish speaking communities through some of our multicultural and multilingual um, staff members. We've been able to explore that. And we've also been able to look at and support uh, nonprofits in how they approach evaluation and want to adapt for the future. We've had a few wonderful projects um, in that variety with Goodwill Incorporated, IME Global Village, and Natural Circles of Support. So here's uh, how you can find us if you're interested in engaging with us. And with that, thank you very much. Hey, hi, good afternoon or good early evening, I should say. Um, my name is Kathy Seiden Thomas. My pronouns are she, her. And as a Madison community member, I'm grateful to be here as a friend of the Commons. 
Um, it's also so nice. I really need my reading glasses to see my notes, but then I also want to see all of you. It's so nice to see so many friendly faces from various aspects of my life these past years. Um, and before I talk about a light, I will share, I'm also a proud member of the Health Poverty Action USA board. So honored to share this um, space with uh, Kelly. And if you have questions about that hat that I wear, <laughs> um, please feel free to ask afterwards. Um, but I want to share a very, very brief story. I know three minutes um, to explain part of my why that connects to this work. Um, so when I was in my mid twenties, I lived in Mali, West Africa for two years, um, partnering with the local community to share HIV STD prevention resources. And the welcoming support of my Malian community um, in every way helped me to stay healthy, to thrive, um, quite possibly to help me last those full two years. Um, and so repaying that hospitality and care that was provided to me um, is part of my life's work. And so I'm really grateful to be able to support a growing movement that I'm just going to spend a couple minutes telling you about today that invites community members to welcome newcomers. Um, so today I'm representing Alight, which is a global humanitarian organization. Um, we began our journey in 1979 as the American Refugee Committee with an enduring belief in the power and possibility and abundance of everyday people. Um, today, we're a borderless organization, and the QR code actually links to an email address. <laughs> so if you want to scan that and send an email to learn more or connect afterwards, that would be awesome. Um, so we're a borderless organization that works with about um, 4 million displaced persons uh, or, or persons experiencing displacement every year. Um, our work outside of the U.S. is focused on supporting livelihoods. One minute. All right. I'm going to fast forward. Um, but today I'm wearing my light hat um, for the U.S. work because I also do work um, with a queer identifying community of displaced persons in Nairobi. But on the U.S. side, um, I'm here to talk about the work that we um, extend to the U.S., um, to both welcome newcomers and then support and build and nurture a network of supporters that ensure newcomers uh, thrive. So to date, we've um, supported over 150 sponsor groups throughout our country um, who, through a new federal resettlement pathway, are matched with um, refugee newcomers, so individuals and families for resettlement in the U.S. The collaboration helps to expand our country's capacity for resettlement. Um, and our goal um, in support of the program is to activate another 100 groups with a focus on the Midwest. Um, volunteering to welcome newcomers not only helps these individuals and families settle softly, but truly enriches our own communities. Um, the refugee communities with which we partner are authorized to work and will be able to access federal benefits. Um, but the welcomers provide them additional support to help access those and, and navigate those resources, but then really to help them um, feel a sense of belonging and integration with the community. And our light sponsorship team um, not only invites, but helps to train and support the welcomers. Um, so the week of November 6th to 9th, we're doing a public events in Madison and Milwaukee to help build awareness of the um, program and the opportunities. So if you're interested in learning more and want a list of the events, um, scan that QR code. There's also flyers on the back and there are events on campus and in the community. So thank you. All right. How's everyone doing? Just a few more of these. You're hanging in there? We're doing all right. After seeing all these great presentations, I'm realizing I didn't quite follow the same format as everyone else, but I think we're going to be just fine. Uh, my name is John Leica. I'm the outreach representative for Rogers Behavioral Health uh, in Madison. And Rogers is a, that's the other direction. There we go. Uh, Rogers is a nonprofit behavioral health organization uh, that treats uh, mental health and addiction. Um, we are focusing on the higher levels of behavioral health care. So um, starting at the most critical stage, which is an inpatient unit, folks are typically in our inpatient units for three to five days, 
occasionally a little bit longer than that. Um, the next step uh, in the continuum of care is residential programming where folks are doing programming all day, but also living on site. Um, so 24 seven uh, care for roughly a month. Um, and then we have outpatient or day treatment programs, um, which are either six hour a day programs or three hour a day programs, five days a week um, that last six to eight weeks long. So proud to offer this full continuum of health for a uh, higher level of behavioral health care needs. Um, I represent the, the Madison Clinic, but um, we're all throughout Wisconsin and even the entire country. You'll find us in uh, Appleton, Sheboygan, Kenosha, uh, Brown Deer, West Dallas, Madison, and Economawak is the mothership. That's our headquarters where we were founded uh, 115 years ago, uh, and that's where the majority of our patients are served. Uh, roughly uh, 1,000 of the patients are in Wisconsin, uh, almost 100 in the Madison Clinic, and about 1,500 patients daily uh, nationwide. Um, while about 90% of the folks in our care um, have comorbidities, um, and so our, our staff are, are trained to treat dual diagnosis, um, you know, we have very specialized treatment programs, and that's really what sets Rogers apart. So we, we specialize in depression recovery, eating disorder, uh, mental health and addiction, uh, OCD and anxiety, and uh, trauma, PTSD. Um, we serve both youth and adults, and 85% of folks who complete our treatment see a significant improvement on the quality of their life. Um, I've shadowed in all of the programs, and as long as well as all my teammates who can speak anecdotally to the tremendous impact we have on folks who, who complete our programs, we have over 25 years of foundation research that collects a million data points each year to back it up. So um, everything is very evidence-based uh, in our programming. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Rogers in Madison or in general, if you're interested in learning more about behavioral health at these higher levels of care that I was referring to, um, just like the behavioral health scene in Dane County or throughout the state, um, that's about where my knowledge ends. No clue on the national level. It includes me there. But, um, or if, or if you might, um, interact with folks who have, um, you know, whether it's students or program participants, um, patients, clients, whatever it might be, folks who need um, additional mental health support, or if you just know a family or friend um, uh, who, you know, a family member or a friend who might need a little extra help, please reach out to me. I'll be hanging out. I have business cards and my info is right there. Cool. Time's up. <laughs> Hello, lovely to see and meet so many new faces. I'm a new faculty in the School of Human Ecology. I am the Liz Kramer Professor of Social Entrepreneurship Innovation. And I'm also um, the Social Innovation Advisor um, in the Commons. So you see lots of affiliations. And what I would say about that is it kind of describes my approach to research. Um, so some people might call it uh, community engaged scholarship, other people uh, call it participatory action research or relational and great engagement um, partnerships. Uh, but basically what it boils down to is that um, very often when we talk about the Wisconsin idea, uh, we prioritize taking the research that's being done at our great institutions within the UW system and making sure that our whole state can benefit from that knowledge and action. But very often when we work collaboratively with community organizations, and in partnership um, from the design stage to understand the needs of a community and how we can work together to investigate a lot of the um, underlying social issues that many people in this room are trying to address. Uh, we can do a better job of creating ideas and insights that actually we can put into action. And when we form these kinds of collaborations and partnerships, we actually then have the connections um, to organizations with the reach in our community, in our state, and globally uh, to convert ideas into action. So most of my research um, centers in a couple specific areas. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the areas of food access programs and networks, mobile markets and food pantries. Uh, some work in the area of just understanding how social impact organizations or community nonprofits share 
their ideas with other people and how they scale. Uh, work in the area of sustainability and building up resilience in our communities. And then finally, um, some work on uh, financial uh, and poverty, resource scarcity, which underlies a lot of uh, the kinds of issues that many of us are addressing. And so what I would say to you is that uh, if these are the kinds of research problems or problems in the community that you're interested in, uh, I would love to talk to you about collaboration um, to help change our community at any level, right? Local, state, global, uh, for the better. Thank you. Yes, good. Hi, um, my name is Mari Gezerowitz. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with uh, Public Health Medicine in Dane County. So I'm government. So like, why am I here? But thank you, Amy Washbush, who um, had an evaluation uh, community of practice group pre-pandemic, and that's how I got connected. Um, so yeah, you can scan the QR code if you want. And I don't represent this organization um, that is that put out the habits cards, but I do think they're great. Uh, it's the Water Center for systems thinking. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So my role at public health is evaluation and systems thinking, really trying to build capacity. And you all are systems thinkers and you are all working on massive complex problems. Probably don't need to give you the background there. So I'll just pull up the first, the card that comes up first when you scan that. It is the, uh, and seeks to understand the big picture. Um, you know, so if you look at, Probably should have put that on there. But anyway, if you've got it, it's a picture of somebody who sees a whole big picture. And one can also imagine, you know, the perspective of the fish or the ants on the on the uh, roots of the trees or any other perspective or the birds for that matter. Um, but this notion of, you know, the big picture for one. So the backs of the cards, and you can flip them on the when you do the QR code. Uh, for example, questions like, am I keeping my focus uh, and bring the glasses, uh, you know, uh, understanding where I can uh, where I can have an impact and what's out of my reach or many of the others. So there are 14 habits and it's really, these are just tools to help us, you know, as I said, we all have in this room and really everybody has systems thinking skills. So it's really helping uh, develop those skills and use common language so that we, as we work on these huge uh complex problems that we can be asking questions that, um, you know, that uh, get us further in the direction of, rather than kind of solving problem after problem, right, that leads to then uh, more unintended consequences to sort of having more sustained impact. So I got. Hello. Um, some of y'all may remember me as Damon Terrell. I still use that name legally, but uh, there's a fun story behind my legally practicing doing business as type name. Um, I'm here to represent Small Axe Cooperative. This has been a long time uh, coming for me. Uh, and to uh, describe this really an experience I'm sure you've all had, there comes this time in a meeting of a nonprofit board where we're desperately debating what should we do with our limited resources to do something for this dystopian hellscape that we inhabit. And over and over and over again, I saw two guys limit the conversation, finance guy and law guy. I'm not very good with finances. But the other thing I came to understand is that both finance guy and law guy are desperately lonely and underappreciated and would really like some folks to talk with. So, um, I did a lot of work with both cooperatives and nonprofits. I think nonprofits are lovely, but I think we need to do more work with what that means. Profit is legally theft. It's not profit until somebody generates it and somebody else takes it home. And our field is so constrained by our misunderstanding of profit that I see idea after idea that could actually help people die. Now, why did I choose law over finance? Because I also experienced a lot of police violence. And a saying that stuck with me over my years is that it is not our failings for which they hate us. 
It is not when I fall short that I find myself at the other end of violence. It is when I'm in my shiniest. It is when I'm at my most real. It is when I'm at my most helpful and supportive. When my community thrives, the response is violence and fire. And so I needed to do something about that. Uh, this is my response. And in developing my response, I found some folks that, that believed in it similarly to I do, and I didn't have to do it alone. And that's why I have a whole cooperative and not just one guy. Um, so far, we're three attorneys, a third year student, and an incredible administrator. Um, and we're looking to grow a little bit, a little bit. Three main areas of focus. One is nonprofit and creative development, small profit development. I, I mean that to be uh, technical assistance in the legal field for folks that need it. Uh, direct service. If you go to the smallx.me or scan that QR code, there's an intake form. I want to help folks get beyond this understanding of what profit is. There's 26 distinctions. We use maybe one of them. That's before subchapter T. It, and why do you even need a liability shield or a tax break? We should talk about that because not all dreams require that. Um, that's my main focus. That's That's the thing that fills my cup. Along with that, we have to understand that police violence is going to continue to be real in, in all of the populations that we serve and the folks that we're trying to serve with. So um, we have a very intentional focus on criminal defense as well. Uh, we take over full cases from Dane County, but we also can do private defense. Um, in addition to that, we work with landlord tenant issues, issues of real property, what happens when your family dies and doesn't have much, but they have something. My time is up, so I just want to briefly state that uh, wrapping around these direct services is uh, a commitment to the popular education model that has really changed my life. Paulo Ferry's work is like so great, and so many people since then. Um, the idea that you make when you treat education as an empowerment, uh, as a sacred relationship, a lot of things happen uh, that are beneficial, worthwhile, and, and, and lead to spirals that are, are effective. So uh, we're trying to build relationships that are less extractive, more supportive, uh, and I want more people to be able to wield the knowledge that is theirs, uh, that is required to function. In so that's what we're up to. Please get at us. I heard a lot of possibilities for collaboration, so do not be shy. I got little one-pagers and, and cards and stuff. Well, thank you so much for being such attentive listeners. What an awesome spectrum of work. That's just a sample platter of all of the things that are happening out there that we sometimes get the privilege to connect to. So network away. The bar and food are there. We need you to eat all the food and um, have have a beverage as well, if that strikes your fancy. Thanks so much. I, I, yeah, I oh, that. internship. Yes. <laughs> Go um, I forgot that. I really, um, I'm Maggie from uh, David's Educational Community, or Educational Opportunity Fund working in Ecuador. And we really, whoops, uh, we really are looking for a good intern. And um, we have lots, of, we're in a strategic planning framework. We're developing our staff in Ecuador. And, and we have wonderful, wonderful students and graduates. Um, so it would be especially good for a Spanish-speaking intern. And if you'd like to talk to us, we'd be open to that. Thanks. Yes.